Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to Scouser Tommy's, the first one of the summer, the last one of the season. However you want to look at it, we're obviously going to still be coming here all, all through the summer, keeping it up to date with what's going on in Liverpool. But this podcast really should have been all about a match, just about a football match, looking back on the season and whether that season had ended with four trophies or two, whether it had ended with no trophies, whatever whatever happened, it should have just been, literally, we should have just really been talking about football and about the build-up to games and about how fans were at the games and stuff. And instead, we're going to be talking about something that could have been even worse than it was, something that shouldn't be happening in this day and age, something, just, just there's no words to kind of put it, to sum it up, really, because it's, it's just a disgrace, it's a farce. And that was what happened, of course, in Paris on Saturday, not the game, which in the end became something of a byproduct of the whole situation and something I don't think I've thought about much since it finished. But what happened before and after and the stories of people who were there and what they went through is something is something that France is going to have to finally own up to and something that UEFA is finally going to have to own up to and they should be ashamed of what they've done and people need to be removed from the post because of what they've done. Uh Maybe myself, I didn't make it to Paris. Um, I can come on to that a little bit later. But Jay Reed, who's with me now, did make it to Paris. And Jay, from what you've already told me and from what I know what's gone on, it's a trip in a lot of ways you wish you'd never made, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was on um, the old school with Gags and Dave and uh, Tom yesterday. And we like, touched on you know all our own experiences. We all had a very different experience really Gags was pretty smooth in terms of entry to the ground and whatever and he travelled a few days before where I had the pleasure or displeasure of going on a coach trip with Coach Innovations who everyone was well aware of I think Friday and Saturday made an absolute hash of collecting fans who had put their trust in the company which seemed very reputable had made trips before and you know just started on Friday afternoon by being told you should have to She'd have to be at the Rocket in Liverpool for anyone who knows where that is. It's the end of the M62 as you're coming into the city um, for four o'clock on Friday afternoon for the collection. And due to, you know, mass disorganisation from them, lack of communication, um, you know, and just people just taking advantage of the situation where we didn't get collected till quarter past nine after several coaches had gone past us for including our own coach and we were told, you know, days before to be there, don't be late. We had to make a certain time for the ferry. You had this allocated seat number, you'd be checked on the bus by a driver and all that. None of that happened. It was just a shambles and, you know, already like 24 hours before the game, you're questioning, is this really worth it? Like, we were thinking, do we not just go home? And, you know, there was, there was several fans there with tickets, genuine tickets, I must add, left in Liverpool without a way to Paris um, and from then on in it just seemed to go downhill and tumble well out of control and as you say um, the game was just 90 minutes um, amongst the weekend that you just want to forget really it was a displeasurable experience and I know there's a lot of fans who go away with Liverpool all over Europe um, there was older guys who were on our coach who had the unfortunate circumstance of being in Hillsborough and the main thing that were coming out of it was it was essentially worse than Hills, but luckily nothing truly tragic happened. But the potential for it was there to happen. And the whole thing has just disenfranchised people were travelling away to Europe, especially to France anyway. And 
there's been other situations across the season, like Benfica most notably, um, the situation where fans were handled there. It's really put a lot of people uneased and making them think twice now about do they actually want to travel away and support this club across Europe because it shouldn't have to play that with a European establishment of a club and you know the fact that fans are questioned should they go with it shows how badly things were handled at the weekend yeah I mean I know I mean I can think of one fan I know that he's been going the game longer than me he's a bit older than me he's been to I would say he'll have been to every single European final every single cup final he'll have been to the vast majority of our games in Europe um, and he, he, it's his life. Football's his life, and it always has been. And he's, a lot of people who go to away will know him. I'm not going to name him because that's that's up to him to kind of come on on shows and say what what he thought. But you know, just just listen to what he was saying afterwards. He's he said he, he, he's not sure if he's going to go the game again, and that that is not something I expected I'd hear from someone like him because because he's just he's a good laugh. You know, he enjoys the game. He spends. I don't know how he affords it. You know, he must spend every penny he's got on following the Reds. And he was supposed to be in Paris for the whole weekend. And in the end, he was like, he hated the fact that he was stuck there. But still, you know, on Sunday and stuff that he wasn't coming home yet. And yet, the the, the reason he booked a weekend is because win or lose, that would have still been, should have been, you know, a weekend to kind of enjoy, enjoy the footy and then maybe just, you know, enjoy some of the local culture. Because that's, that's what Liverpool fans have done. For decades now that we we head abroad and we and we tend to have a good time wherever we are we tend to be well liked by the locals i mean there might be a bit of mess left behind if you're in a fan park but the people in the fan parks know that otherwise they'd leave more bins around for you to put your stuff into you know it's that you know they, they expect rubbish to be left behind in a fan park that, that's what happens you know look at glastonbury look at any music festival there's rubbish left behind afterwards and there's people who go in and sort it out um it's it's just it's just it just tells you everything. And I think when you said then that we're lucky that there weren't more more horrific words that we're using about what happened. And a lot of that, I think, is down to the fact that a lot of Liverpool fans either have direct experience of Hillsborough or have had it told to them and, and known about it for so long that they're kind of already on the lookout for the danger signs. And I did, a few people have said to me that they feel that that having people amongst the crowds who kind of knew the dangers was helping people to kind of, you know, there's people shouting others to get back because, you know, it's getting getting crazy down here. Um, but I think the parallels with Hillsborough are inevitable. You can't you cannot get away from them. And I think even the parallels to Heisel, which Liverpool fans got charged with manslaughter over what happened in Heisel, and there's no no part of me is going to excuse them for what they did. Because you know, you should, no matter how provoked you are, you've got to you've got to draw the line somewhere. And there's a lot more to that though than just you know some fans getting drunk and wanting to fight. That that's not what happened. And and the the underlying thing to me from Heisel was that if the authorities had acted properly and, and dealt with the fans properly and done it in a stadium that was fit to be used, that there wouldn't have ever been a situation where anyone could have got killed through the actions of some others. It's like. Without you know, it's like in in America now where they give people guns and the yeah the the guy that goes into the school and shoots all the kids is the one that's done it. He's at fault, but so are all the people who armed him. So are all the people who said it was okay for you to have a gun for whatever cooked up reason you had. And I think UEFA in after Heisel didn't take enough of the responsibility for what they did and what they did wrong. It was just so easy to just blame it all on Liverpool fans. Who yes, Liverpool fans had a responsibility, but the idea of just saying that. It's okay because it's them, and we did nothing wrong. It was just just typical UEFA. We fast forward all these years, and it was much the same from the FA. They didn't try and they they tried to sort of wash the hands of it. They sort of joined in with all the late fans arriving stuff, and certainly in the initial stages, you know, when we fast forward now, and it's UEFA again getting told by the French authorities that it was late arrival of fans. The interesting thing as well is on the on the scoreboard when it said, or the, the the big screen, when it said what was going on, the cause for delay, it said it was for security concerns, not safety concerns, security concerns. And straight away, that, that one little difference of one word, which even a few letters in that word, tells you the mindset you're dealing with. And um, I mean, I've said, I've seen people say that it felt hostile as soon as you got to the ground, not from the fans, but from the police, would you say? Is that something you felt as well when you got there? I'd say it was hostile from the minute we got to Paris, personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what I will say, you, you touched on obviously the actions of the Liverpool fans. Had that have been another club with 
more unruly fans, um, fans who were notorious and probably causing a bit more trouble and disruption when they are abroad. And I think we know them clubs are. You don't need to name and shame them. There would have well been a much more of a tragedy, as you say. It was the, the self-policing of the Liverpool fans um, and the experiences which you've been taught and those, unfortunately, have lived through. That remained the situation as it did. But, yeah, it was... It was a hostile sort of environment. We we arrived Saturday afternoon when we were told we were arriving Saturday morning. So we were already a bit, you know, tired and grouchy because we'd travelled for the best part of about 17, 18 hours just to get to Paris um, from leaving Liverpool. And then we were dropped near to the fan park and, you know, there was fans on our coach who didn't have tickets who had plans to go to the fan park and watch it because that was... An, um, a way of watching and trying to, you know, contain Liverpool fans into one area, which we'll get onto that later, um, about the actions at the fan park. Um, but everyone sort of made the, the way in the direction of the fan park and, you know, every avenue you tried to get access to, there was barricades and there was heavy-handed police with, you know, rifles and batons and fire shields telling you to, no, go away, go away. To, you know, send you way out on a wild goose chase looping around like numerous streets and narrow streets to get to the very, very back of the fan park to try and gain entrance to it. Um, which we understand it was, you know, it's it gated the, the sides, but we weren't getting anywhere close. We were sent further and further away to try and get access. Um, and then we didn't actually even get in the fan park, to be fair. We got to the very back of it and there was a small park there where there was a lot of fans gathered. But even then, we were getting weird from people who had gone to the stadium early to A, be careful for the amount of pickpockets on the trains or the metro system as it is over there um, and B, be very careful around the ground because it's really busy and there's a lot of pickpockets operating. Um, so we gathered into a large group with like seven other people who we knew and travelled in a large number of about 12 of us um, to ensure that, you know, safety in numbers sort of thing and just getting on the trains alone there was people hanging around train stations there was people moving in and out of carriages on trains forcing you like you know into situations where like you are backs to the wall but we were you know amongst ourselves savvy enough to say like right any personal belongings we all had small bags put them underneath your t-shirt or underneath your jacket and make sure like you keep your arm on it and don't have anything in your pockets because, you know, the potential is there to be done. And then, you know, we, we arrived at the Stade de France metro station as it's labelled, which is a fifteen minute walk from the Stade de France. So it's it's nowhere actually near the Stade de France. Okay. It takes you through like a a few like a few blocks of high rise buildings um where there's there's a lot of people ain't going in one direction, but also coming in the other direction, a locals and other people, you know, like trying to, you know, just create a sense of confusion. And then yeah. it, it, it was just, yeah, we, we got, we had to go into a subway to underpass what was like a motorway. And the subway was no more than like 10 people wide. And you're trying to force thousands of fans underneath a subway sort of line to get underneath a motorway underpass to, to get to the other side so when we then come out it opened up for around about 50 to 80 yards where a lot of people were then gathering as you filtered out of the subway which for itself had the potential for you know panic and crushing because it was underground and then the police fans which have been pictured all over the internet were parked in a formation as to bottleneck fans down past a concrete wall and the police fans with the police in them and outside of them where you were no more than three or four each to get through that gap so the bottom next situation there was crazy um, and you, you you were just led into situations at one after another after another and it was all manufactured by the French police or the French authorities whoever's the blame obviously we see the French police on the ground but they're also dressed in full riot gear, they know any sort of reaction 
they were ready to react. They didn't want people filming them because it's a police state and there's a law being passed where you can't film the police. So anybody with the phones in the air sort of trying to film and take pictures of what's happened, if they would be able to reach out to you, they would reach out and try and hit your arms and knock them out your hand. So yeah. I mean, why it's would just you, a crazy why would you pass situation. such a law? Why would you pass such a law? What yeah. have you got to hide exactly, isn't it? It's just... I mean, the thing that you say me as well, the thing that, that keeps coming out, the word that you keep using on this is, as you're sort of describing your journey from one place to another, is police. The police here, police here, police here, police here. Any event you go to that I'm used to going to, and even in, in Kiev for the final we last had against Real Madrid, it's not police that you see on the whole. It's stewards. It's UEFA staff or people who you know are doing the gig for UEFA. It's friendly, helpful people who are trying to get you to get from A to B and trying to point you in the right direction so that you don't end up going off the beaten path, you know, so that you don't end up going down some place you don't want to go or you shouldn't be going, you know, for your benefit in case it's somewhere that's a bit dodgy or, and for the residents' benefit because, you know, no doubt people who, who, who live a little bit out of the catchment area don't want to be sort of plagued by loads of Liverpool fans in good mood singing songs and stuff, which is fine. Just just help, just get stewards. But the fact that it's police tells you straight away, again, this mindset that's that's been in there, that from the off, they've basically looked at Liverpool and they've thought, they, they, they've basically listened to the lies told by the Sun. They've listened, they've seen the actions of England fans and let's face it, England fans have got that reputation. They've totally misunderstood what kind of fan base we are. They've, they've, they've done it to other English clubs as well from what I've heard. I've even had Chelsea fans telling me they had trouble about, about, I've seen Everton fans talking about trouble they had a while back. It's it's something about the mentality, but it's not. It's just not. It's not even that there's sort of some dodgy police and they're going to deal with it. The fact is the the ministers came on afterwards and backed it all up. But they're so bad at lying, the figures don't add up whatsoever. The 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 thing. I mean, when you got to the stadium, when I, I'll say, I mean, when I went to when I went to Kiev, it's a similar thing to yourself. It was it was a sort of a grueling journey. We did it in a flight that we were literally home and back sort of within 25 hours or something like that, you know, with everything, everything all told, never stopped, you know, on your feet all the time. And that's part of the reason why I couldn't really go this time because my health, I don't, not a secret, I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. I manage it right quite well, doing great, but just lately it's not been, not been the best. So I didn't fancy sort of risking going, going to Paris in case it was one of those grueling days. Now I'm just absolutely made up. I didn't go because I dread to think what state I'd be in having to struggle as much as everyone did just to get just to get to the game and just to get away. It would have it wouldn't have done me any good whatsoever. And yet in Kiev, despite that being a grueling day in itself, everyone you saw was friendly. Everyone was helpful. Everyone wanted you to to enjoy yourself and they were glad to have you. You know, the people of Kiev were welcoming of us and you know, I, at the moment, obviously, it's a shame Kiev's being destroyed. But I'd, I'd, I'd go to Kiev a million times, was permitted. Yeah, it was the same with to, Madrid. To go to Paris. Yeah, yeah. We went to Madrid with no tickets and went to Fan Park and found some local bars. And the people of Madrid couldn't be more welcome. Um, from the minute we actually arrived in Madrid, like helping you out, giving you directions to the Fan Park and going into shops and supermarkets, buying food and drink and stuff. Like, they couldn't be more helpful. Um, complete, complete opposite situation to what it was in France. That ticketless thing as well. So this is another one that I want to touch on because you see it a lot, especially from the, from I'll, I'll use the best word I can think of, from the dickheads who just love to score points against other clubs because they've just got, they've got no credibility themselves, is this thing about ticketless fans, right? There is nothing wrong with ticketless fans if you go to a to a country and to a city where there's a big event going on, as a Liverpool fan, unless I'm mistaken, and this is everyone I can think of who ever does it, the way you do it is you go because you want to be part of that occasion, you want to be part of that atmosphere, you want to be in the bars with the others, and in the back of your mind you're hoping that someone, someone, somewhere is going to end up with a spare ticket that you can have. Or maybe you know someone. I mean, I, when I went to Kiev, I didn't get my ticket until I was on the flight over. But I knew before I went, I had a maybe 75, 80% chance of getting one because of different people that were kind of keeping their ears open for me. And in the end, I got one on the plane at face value. Great, great seat, everything. You know, off, off a great Liverpool fan who, who wanted to make sure it went to a Liverpool fan, you know, wanted to make sure it went to someone who was going to use it themselves. You don't, you don't go as a ticketless fan with the intention of trying to get in and break in. That's, that's not why people go without the tickets, is it? They go 
because like I said, you're part of an event, you're part of an occasion, and maybe just maybe someone somewhere will have a spur that's come that's come up. And I imagine there's a few did that after what you're saying has happened with the coaches as well. So this is this is what happens. Yeah, and you know, you'd be a fool to deny the fact that always there's a few chances you go with free tickets to any mm-hmm. event, as you say, to Glastonbury, to gigs, you know, major sport events. Um, there will always be a counterfeit market and people will pay the money and take the chance and there is no denying that but the the outdated figures of 30,000 people is way out of control like if they they weren't willing to accept ticketless fans why did they put a fan park for 40,000 people on and agree to show the game it's it's a complete contradiction so they can't say like oh we only wanted fans with tickets here but we're also giving you this you know this venue or this area for fans without tickets to, to safely or what it was deemed originally a safe yeah. place to watch the game as it transpired it was very far from it um, but yeah like it, it was it's just so like feels like they're coming up with excuses after the excuses and at first it was it was too many fans or fans arriving late then it was fake tickets then it was this then it was that like they're literally scrambling around looking for what's at the bottom of the barrel that they can scrape and put out there as an excuse when the only thing now that I think compared to Hillsborough is much more people are aware of what went on. People have got phones, people have got pictures, video evidence. You've got social media now where you can voice your thoughts and opinions. There's that many people now with a voice that you can't be silenced, you can't be ignored, you can't be told that you were, you were doing this. We can't be proved that we are liars. It's it's those who are lying in authority now, and that will carry on yeah. and prove it. And I must say, like I, I was more surprised when I got home that the actual coverage from Sky and Carve Solico, who was there. I mean, I've always had him down as a bit of a fool who sort of like chat rubbish about transfers, but to his credit, as well as other journalists, you know, Simon Hughes, Melissa Reddy and so on, they've all come out in support of Liverpool fans and said that they were not at fault whatsoever. Like, this is all on the French, whether it's the authorities, the UEFA, the police, it's all on them. And it's such a relief that, like, for once now, we are being backed by major media um, outlets and proven that, you know, in the past, we knew they were lying. We just couldn't fully prove it to everyone because they would never listen. When now, I think we've got that much evidence. Yeah. Eventually, we will be heard and we will be listened. Yeah, that's it. I mean, for the whole hills, really, time and time again, I, I I spent so much time talking to people and writing articles and posting on Twitter or wherever else, and just just trying to explain to people. And a lot of people were shocked when you told them what happened at Hillsborough because they'd only ever really heard the stuff that was in the press and they hadn't really ever had an opportunity to kind of look at it with an open mind and just be sent some information that kind of said, look, here's what happened. You know, here's here's really what happened. Here's lots of evidence of it. And but that evidence, like you say, was mainly coming in the form of, of people's kind of words of themselves, their own memories, their own recollections. And, and you know, the, the fact that there were so many recollections is what gave the evidence so much credibility because the stories were straight because they were telling the truth. No one was saying stuff and thinking, ah, now, come on, that doesn't add up. Unlike the French authorities who were making stuff up, they've just basically shot themselves in the foot by coming out with this stuff. They've not only lied, they've tried to, you know, as if they've gone and thought, oh, God, that might not sound convincing enough. How many, should we say, had fake tickets or didn't have tickets there? You know, let's make it 40. Let's say 40,000. They're, they're just too arrogant and stupid and corrupt to see how inaccurate that is and how in- instantly that made them look foolish. Because even if you hadn't seen any other evidence, if you'd have heard the words that they'd come out with, you'd have been scratching your head and thinking, now hang on a minute, there's something not right here. Something doesn't add up here. But you're right, the, the people who've got on our case for us has been has been brilliant. Henry Winter has been great. I mean, I we used to laugh about Henry Winter because he used to put stuff on Twitter and we used to joke that he was like a kind of posh journalist who never who never replied to tweets but he was actually all right and he started replying some years ago and he he knows i think he does know his stuff and he does have an open mind and he's definitely got our backs over stuff like this and he's shown that in the last few days and and a surprising one in a way is roman kemp who's the 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 son of spandau ballet uh, guitarist martin kemp 
so for the older, yeah, older yeah. generation, for the younger generation, they'll know full well who he is because he's the host on Capital Radio, which is a national station now, the breakfast show host. He was there. He's an Arsenal fan. I know some people said, why is an Arsenal fan there? But let's face it, there's so many people get to the Champions League through sponsorship and so on. And you'd want to go if you were offered a chance through a sponsor. So I can't fault him for that. He was on his radio show that Monday morning and basically just saying how bad it really was. He was he couldn't be clearer. You know, he said Liverpool fans were fantastic. Every bar I went to, they were respectful of the owners. They weren't spilling out on this onto the streets. It was great. There was no trouble. I didn't see one fight. Nothing. Really, really polite. And he just and he, he spoke at length about about what the Liverpool fans were like, and then what it was like with them. You know, he said the second we got there, it was hostility, which is exactly what what you just said. And the fact is, that for the non-believers who, who sort of you know need to kind of almost be thrown in front of it to see things with their own eyes it's all these other voices that help add even more credibility to what's being said and because they, these are people talking about their own experiences in the same kind of shot that you are yeah i mean it's, it's just stark contrast to what happened in 1989 like we were silenced we're now we're not and you just hope that you know it, it's now coming out as well i think in the last 24 hours like videos from Madrid and where they were being held in in large numbers waiting to get in and Madrid fans have come out in voice and saying no it was not just Liverpool fans with the French are trying to to paint us with that picture it was also was that suffered um, but what I, what I did say yesterday as, as I was on the old school pod was they seemed to be in a lot faster than us like our end was really sparse like the block I was in was empty for 45 minutes and then obviously you get the messages that you know apparently we were turning up late when actually the reality was it was the police and security that were holding people out um, but the Madrid end was was healthily full um, but yeah the, 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 the people are coming out and now speaking about this and writing about this it, it can't be ignored and you know they've got the World Cup or the Rugby World Cup coming up and the Olympics coming up in in a few years I mean, I'd be all for advocating the fact that either English teams boycott that, or they should be taken off. Well, they should be taken off them completely because it's clearly shown that they cannot handle a major mm -hmm. sporting events. They tried to come up with the excuse they were they were given short notice as well. If if that was the case, don't take the gig. I like, if you can't handle something at that short notice, don't take the gig. You was happy enough to take the gig. You were happy enough to probably take all the money that you were for throwing at you. And everything else that comes with it, but if you clearly can't handle it, and it's proven now that you can't handle major sporting events, then things should be taken off them because they're not able to provide safe hospital hospitable. I can't even say it, hospitality for mm. fans to get to the stadium. And an Olympics goes on for what three weeks, two, three weeks, using a major stadium. I mean. Are they honestly going to be able to provide for that long? Because they couldn't even provide for one night. Um, exactly. Yeah. One night. And, one night. Fans from yeah. two countries. You know, compared to weeks with fans from all over the world and athletes from all over the world. You know, it's like, you know, there's there's sort of thirty players or whatever get involved in a game of football, and the coaches and so on. I mean, how many athletes are involved in the Olympics? It's, it, you know. Well, it even went down to the fact that I'm sure someone was saying. The Real Madrid coach was given a large police escort into the stadium, mm. and the Liverpool coach weren't. I mean, I don't know I because that. it was on TV. I imagine I don't want to watch anything back about it because I want to forget no, the weekend. I've not seen it, but I did see someone say it was like one, one, you know, like hardly any escort for the for the Liverpool coach, and like you know, a, like a army load of outriders for the Real Madrid one, you know. Yeah, and I mean, the whole thing I, I had in my head was this is all a setup, like. This is all a huge setup against us, and you don't want to use, like tie into all that the hashtag of "use are always victims" sort of thing, oh, because you know it feeds a narrative of idiots at other clubs. But we were targets for this one. We weren't. You could say we were victims, but we were targets. We were targeted to be given the worst treatment that we could to get into the ground, the worst type of access. Obviously, the team we given, you know alternative treatment to Real Madrid and you don't have to look at bloody the referee's performance on the night it was it was blatant 
if it was a referee who was a homer and Real Madrid got a home, that's what you would have called him. But the decisions on the night by him was outlandish, some of the things that he came out with. But it just felt like a one big corrupt setup, and the fact that it was always targeted that Real Madrid are the glorious European club. And these are some rough ass club from England. You know, make sure whatever happens, they get the best treatments and, you know, just sort the rest because the dirty English. And as you said earlier on, we are like, we pride ourselves on being scouts and not English. It's, it's a well documented thing and people don't understand it. But you've only got to look, for example, the behaviour of England fans at the European Championships last summer to the behaviour of Liverpool fans on the weekend. We were respectful we were well behaved we didn't cause aggravation we didn't storm gates we didn't do anything what the english fans notoriously do on a regular basis when they go abroad we are completely opposite to them and that's why we all along with many other things in the week of the jubilee which won't be celebrated in liverpool the queen's jubilee like we pride ourselves on being scouts first and English has just happened to be where we were born in that country. Yeah, it's who we're legally, we're legally governed by, isn't it? It's not who we're sort of morally and and spiritually governed by because we don't, we don't have connections to them. And I think, I think I feel more connected to Wales or to Ireland than I do to England because, because when I see, as you say, when I see those England fans wearing the Crusader outfit, stood on some terraces, and then they're off out to go and do some fighting afterwards, and. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a way, I'm been stereotyping the whole load of England fans because they aren't all like that. But the truth is, that is their identity that they have built up because of how they are, and the FA hasn't done enough to stop it and stamp it out, in my opinion. But it's, it's the kind of mentality of the people who follow England, and it's a lot of them aren't even fans of Premier League clubs, and it's kind of like the more the fans of England before the fans of their club, and they aren't even fans of England, the fans of the trouble. You don't see that. I mean, to be fair, the Welsh side. Of, until recently, I haven't been involved in lots of major tournaments, but when they are, you don't hear about trouble with them. The Irish fans, same again, you don't hear about trouble. You hear about loads of people going and having good crack and really enjoying themselves and, and memories being made and all the rest of it. And and in them cases, the match ends up being a little blip in, a, in an amazing weekend or an amazing week or whatever because of all the fun they've had outside the game itself. And so, you know, that's how I look back on Kiev. It was a great mad 24 hours where we lost a game but that's not the memory I've got the, the the match is hardly in my memory from that from that trip but for good reasons because of because of how good the rest of the day was but the exact opposite with with this and I, I do think there's some sort of sort of um they, they were kind of hoping for it almost and I think if they'd had See that it was Liverpool that was in the final this time but it could have easily been City it could have easily been Chelsea you know it could have been e- easily any English club who'd qualified for the Champions League could have been in that final. And, you know, if it hadn't been this year, it could have been in a year to come. And they were just waiting, like you say, just waiting. And I think if that had been fans of certain other clubs, they would have kicked off. They would have kicked yeah. off with what the way they were being treated. And then you'd have had the scenes that the, that the French authorities would have just loved to see. You know, and to get England, and I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is like you mean really stretching conspiracy theories here. But one of the big wigs at UEFA also happens, I believe, to be the PSG owner, um, a guy from Qatar of all places. Yeah, and how would they love it if the English clubs were knocked out of Europe? You know, what what would that mean? With PSG, they can't buy European cups, but maybe. Well, maybe they can force other ways into it. I mean, this is you know, that, that's a hell of a conspiracy theory. I'm not, I'm not saying that is what happened at all. But what I'm saying is that's that's how bad it was. It just felt premeditated. Yeah, and we we had all agreed, like me and friends and family and whatever. Had City got through, we weren't going because you know the situation would happen at the semi final at Wembley. The way they were disrespectful towards um, the memory of the Hillsborough and. You know, just some of the things that they come up with, some of the tripe that we had on the train, and mm. you know, we were we were big enough to not rise to it because a you're on public transport, and b you don't want to get yourself arrested. You want to get back to Liverpool in one piece. Um, but you know, other people will. And had it been Liverpool and Man City, like it was a recipe for disaster, even more because it would have been doubly, you know both sides of the stadium from whatever, both sides of 
um, whatever approach uh, the other end of the stadium was coming from, they would have went heavy handed for for action with everybody. And you know, it it, it it's a scary thought that that was so close to happening and it didn't. And I think a lot of Liverpool fans probably would have not travelled had it been Man City because it was Real Madrid. They thought, you know, we've been to Madrid before when we had them in Kiev. It, it was a jovial atmosphere. It was, you know, friendly when we went over to Madrid, even though it was played at Atletico Madrid's ground. Like, I watched the game in the shadow of the Bernabeu. Um, it was just a good atmosphere. Like, they're European giants for a reason, but they're also... You know the the knowledgeable fans to a, to the credit that they're not going to go there and kick off and like you don't have to look as well at like, the very end of the game that we pointed out. I don't know if it came across on the TV, but about eighty five minutes, the whole Liverpool end was lined up between Liverpool fans on the pitch with riot police in yeah. full gear. Mm-hmm. Not one police officer went to the Real Madrid end, so they they knew like it felt like it was ready to go off like they were going to climb the barricades and jump into the crowd and start forcing us out the other way and then it felt like you were again going into a trap so there was messages going around like we we sent messages to everyone was on the phone saying like get out of here quick because they give the impression that as soon as that final whistle went they were coming in to get us and when we then come out of the ground limited amount of gates were open for us to leave yeah, when gates. Every, I've seen pictures of gates every exit locked. point should be open, yeah. and we were forced with um, riot shields and batons to go in directions of gates, and you like open this gate, and you know you get the the usual shove of a riot shield towards you or a baton, like threatening you to go in a certain way, and you're like we physically can't go the other way. Open the gate, and you just completely ignored. And then once you got into the outer ring of the stadium, it was gangs of youths and locals waiting in balaclavas, people had knives, people had bottles they were chasing Liverpool fans it was just a really, really scary experience, like, it was like being in a war zone and you meant to have gone to a football match like, obviously we were, we were downbeat with what went on before and we were downbeat with the result and then you come out and you're encountered with this, like, that shouldn't be happening and the police are forcing us into situations where they should be policing what's going on in the outside of the and they shouldn't be allowing people to hang around with knives and bottles. However, they were forcing us into that situation. It felt like a whole big setup between the police, the security, the locals, the, the authorities. And I, the pickpockets were rife. So many people got stuff stolen. It was at the gate when we were trying to get into the ground. Like, as you're getting your ticket out of your pocket, they was the, there was locals pickpockets stood next to the security as they were so called checking your tickets, trying to pull your arms, steal your phones and your pockets, and they were doing nothing about it. And like fans were saying, like, "Are you going to sort this out?" And they give you the old oh, no English sort of thing. And maybe they don't speak English, but it's clearly evident that these people don't have tickets. Move them on, get You've them out the way. They've got eyes, they've got, if, and they should have experience. If they've not got experience, they shouldn't even be there. That's why another reason Hillsborough happened, because the match commander had no experience and he was a coward who, who gave a stupid order and then pretended he hadn't for years and years and years and never admitted to it. And even when he was finally given the chance to own up to it, he didn't. And that's that's the kind of people who get these jobs and shouldn't. They, they're a disgrace, because I know now not all police are bad. Like the Merseyside police who went there and have said the fans' behaviour was exemplary. They went there as observers and said the behaviour was exemplary. And I hope people within Merseyside police are going to raise this in whatever kind of, you know, within their world, if you like, of you know, of with other police forces however you do it they need to send a message to them that they've got some learning to do in in france and i wonder because like i mean one one guy got onto me you know and he said and i mean and he was in shock he, he messaged me a friend of mine and he's like he said we were tear gassed on the way out kids and women everywhere people in wheelchairs the pe- the police were laughing as he threw canisters and sprayed and he said he, you know seen a lot in all these years never anything like this calm fans exiting the stadium once out the police were gassing everyone and it's just it's and you know what with the gates being shut directing everyone down one way making them disorientated making them ill making them 
AI stream and all the rest of it, leaving them in shock and in distress and in fear. And you're directing them straight into where the, all the gangs of people are waiting to do all the pickpocketing and the mugging and everything. Jason McAteer's wife and son got attacked. His wife got a, a phone stolen, the bruised and battered, and it's it's disgusting. It's 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 but. Was it done deliberately? You know, you watch things like Line of Duty or something on the TV here and you hear about, you know, there's corrupt police officers arranging things to happen and, and stuff like that. Was that, it, it almost feels that this is what happened, that there's some corruption in the police somewhere and they said, lock all the gates, send them all down that way, pelt them with tear gas and all the rest of it. And then our mates who do all the crime stuff that, you know, the, the sort of mafia side of things and of the police are, we're gonna go and uh, we're gonna go and make arrangements for them that they can get, get easy pickings of everyone's phones and jewelry and everything. It's just there's just too much that's bad, and because of this, there, there shouldn't even be a question. The Olympic Committee and the Rugby World Cup people, whoever they are, should instantly be saying that both of those events are under review, and they need to say that clearly and unequivocally that they would not stand for that kind of treatment at their events. Otherwise, they're just as bad, and it would suggest that money, again, is just a thing that, that reels them, and, and that sort of brings me on to UEFA, because there's been a lot of talk that sponsors are getting kicking off about it now, because one thing about all those people going to the game who aren't fans of either club and get tickets, a lot of them will be getting tickets because they are somehow working with the sponsor they might be guests of the sponsor in some way and the sponsors have had people that went to the match as their guests were also getting attacked and tear gassed and is this the only way we're going to get through to uefa is to get the sponsors to threaten to pull their money it could well be i mean money seems to be the underlying factor in everything these days especially when it comes to football it's you know it, it's a business um especially at the top end of the game anyway and even at the bottom end it's it's a business to an extent but you know you, you referenced Nasser Al-Khalifi before the PSG owner um, he's got his fingers in all sorts of pies at UEFA and you know it, it the dragon the competition into different realms in two or three years or whatever they're trying to change this that and the other and it just feels as though it's like all driven towards the money laden mm clubs with with dirty money, not genuine money. Um, you know, like people can earn money in whatever varieties and ways that they want to, but you know, the the dirty or your money clubs and the ones who are, are cheating the system and doing anything they can to get to where they deem they feel like they should be. Um are ruining the sport. I mean, I had had the pleasure or displeasure of having Simon Jordan on talk sport earlier on when I was in the card and mm. They were on about the the uh, the Chelsea takeover, and they said like you know there was a Chelsea fan saying Roman Abramovich deserves a statue outside the ground, and he was aghast. He was like, absolutely not. He came in, and he was part of the reason football's what it is now because he he spoiled so much money into the game that other clubs felt like that was the only way they could do it, and you know it was dirty money, his connections with Putin and stuff, and so on and so forth. Everyone knows, like all that stuff in the background with Abramovich. But the underlying fact of what he said was he come in and he put that much money into the game. He sped up the downfall of it being a sport and it being a business. And that's coming from him, of all people. Yeah. You know, like, he says some awful stuff, but he does say now and again a few things that are actually quite right. And that was something I sat there in agreement with, thinking, uh, yeah. you know, uh, he, he, he's, he's saying the he, right thing. He's, he's, he's one of them, isn't he? I mean, he's one of them people who, like... I mean, you could argue that that old saying that a broken clock's right quite, right twice a day and all that kind of stuff, but he does sometimes come out with stuff. And he... I mean, I'm sure as well, if you actually got the chance to sit and chat with him over a pint, you could talk, you could talk him round to stuff on the things he's wrong about as well, or at least you'll maybe get Try. a better understanding <laughs> of why why he says what he says. Because, I mean, the thing is, people like that, they're in a, the only reason TalkSport put them on is because they say stuff that's controversial that they can take a few sound bites from and stick out on the social channels and keep drawing people in the next day and they can play it through through other shows in different bits of jingles and things that go on. So that that's that's their role. And it's, it's like kind of like the Piers Morgan kind of person. It's, they're just there. Every so often, Piers Morgan says something you agree with, but he's only taking a stance that he thinks will get him some more attention half the time. But the thing is, it doesn't mean what he's saying is wrong on those occasions. It's just his, his motives are not what they should be. It's 
it's um it, it's good though that that you know the the we've got those all those kind of people in the media but there's just this sort of universal agreement that liverpool were badly treated that uefa are corrupt that the french police are corrupt that the french governments are probably corrupt as well that you know that, that this is this is an, an international scandal that you know it, it's another there's, there's part of me thinks because of things like this i'm almost glad we're not in the eu but really i'm not i'm i'm, I'm disappointed we're not in the eu because i think we'd have more clout to go to the eu and say something and say this isn't right can you please sort this out the the uefa have, have said they're going to do an independent investigation the trouble with that is that they've got an mp from portugal to do it now i'm going to be open-minded about it apparently you know it's probably okay but the truth is it's lying politicians that, that put us in these situations and um talking of politicians as well i mean you were just you were just talking about what abramovich did and his part of the making football so money money oriented was was you know it'll go down in history of, of a There'll be like a line that you can draw of when that really started to kick off and then another line when the City came in. And there'll be another line now that Chelsea have got these new owners that I'm assuming are going to get to spend all the money they want without any penalty for all that money that was fed in, I think, almost certainly against FFP because you don't give someone a loan and don't expect them to pay you back. So there's, the, you know, I don't see how they can get around it, but that's, that's nothing. Where it kind of kicked off in a lot of ways was someone... Back in the day, he was the chairman of a football club, one of the clubs that was in the first division that was going to become the Premier League. And they were trying to talk about a new TV deal. And he got wind of what had been offered by ITV, who at the time had been the only sort of broadcasters to show any live football on TV. And he then went, he was also, as well as being the chairman of Tottenham Hotspur, he was also the chairman of Amstrad, who made set-top boxes for satellite TV. And therefore, he was in with Sky because obviously the two were working hand in hand because he was making the boxes people would use to get Sky TV when it was about to be really launched in the country. And according to reports, he got onto Sky, told them what ITV had bid and said, blow them out of the water. And they did. I mean, to be fair, Sky put a bid in that ITV probably would never have matched. But he's now a lord, Lord Sugar. And if that's really what happened, really, I mean... I'm sure that's kind of insider trading, really. I'm sure that's not... If it's not illegal, it's certainly not ethical. Yet he's now a lord and a politician and all the rest of it. And th this this is kind of how it works, isn't it? You Politicians get rewarded for their dishonesty. Yeah, I mean, you could go on for hours about British mm. politics and how corrupt and everything it is. I mean, you've only got to look at, you know, recent times, if, if recent weeks, whatever, like, reports coming out of parties and, you know, people being there fined apart from one person who happens to be the man at the top of the shop not being fined. Like, it just says it all about, like, corruption within authorities and sadly, we live in parts of the world where you know, they have far, far, far too much power where they have the influence over so many people. Um, and yeah, I, it, you just wonder where it stops. Um, and, you know, as we said, we've said, like, full circle, like, it, it's it's the French who, who manifested this. And I don't know if I've just been blind to it, but I don't seem to have seen much kickback from the British authorities and the British government. No. And I don't know if that's purely because it's Liverpool. Had it been Chelsea or Manchester United or Arsenal, you know, I don't think Arsenal will get to European finals, but, you know, Chelsea and Manchester United who are, you know, one's a, the royalist club in London, one is the the biggest club in the world in quotation marks, um, or in England, whatever you want to put it, um, even though the trophy can prove that they're not. But they, they would have been much more publicly backed, I think. I think this is again a play on it's Liverpool and, you know, the whole thing that we have with the Tory governments and stuff like we're not asking for favours. We're not asking for handouts. We're not asking necessarily saying, give us your support. But the fact that they've not even bothered to publicly show much support to us says it all. Like, that tells yeah. you all you need to know. We're not asking for them to do it. But, you know, get off your actual backside and do it. And we might just sit there and think, oh, you know, well, that's nice of you to at least show a little bit of compassion towards us. But it doesn't seem forthcoming at all. Well, the, 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 the sickening thing in a lot of ways is that the Minister for 
I can't remember what the department's called, but I think it's Culture, Media and Sport is, the, is its posh name in this country, is someone called Nadine Doris, who sits in a, on a Twitter profile, points out that she's a Scouser because she was born in Liverpool. But in all honesty, she comes across about as Scout as Prince Andrew. Um, and probably, well, I won't say any more than that because it's probably libelous, but she's not she's not the kind of person that you'd want to be back in your corner if you're from Liverpool because, in all honesty, she doesn't live here. She uses it as a bit of an excuse now and again, I think, to kind of make out that she's somehow in touch with the people. She threw a tweet out early on when the, when the sort of... We were still at the point where it was a late kickoff. There wasn't loads of information out about what was going on. In, you know, in the, in the public domain, and she just threw some half-hearted tweets out. Eventually, she passed some comment the day after. I mean, she should have been sending people, she should have been out on the strongest words possible, saying that something needs to be done, even if she worded it in a kind of diplomatic way, you know, to say we need to find the facts. Anything like that would have been helpful. But half-hearted tweet, you know, and it, you're almost sort of waiting for her to think, I wonder if it's trouble. I wonder if it's Liverpool fans causing trouble. Oh, I'll just wait before I do my next tweet. And she's almost disappointed that it wasn't. Because she doesn't, you know, she's got nothing in common with Liverpool fans or the city of Liverpool other than the word on a birth certificate, which I wouldn't be surprised if we found out she was actually born in North Wales or something. But and nothing against the people of North Wales. I wouldn't want to put her on you. But this, <laughs> this is it. And... What I've loved, though, is... Oh, just quickly on politicians as well, I'm going to quickly say, Sadiq Khan, Liverpool fan, Mayor of London, Labour politician, Labour Mayor of London, he was at the game. He said nothing whatsoever. He hasn't even acknowledged it happened. That's really disappointing. Words from him as the Mayor of London aimed at the Mayor of Paris. Just think of the power they would carry. Not a word. He was obviously over on a jolly, and I'm really disappointed. Meanwhile, Andy Burnham, the Everton-supporting Mayor of Greater Manchester, you know, I mean, there are, he's, he's the Mayor of the of the region that has two of the clubs in the North that hate Liverpool the most, and he's a supporter of the club that hates Liverpool the most. Yet, he knows this isn't about football, and he said... It's clear Liverpool supporters have been seriously wronged by UA for the French police and government. Everyone should get behind them, as the same will continue to happen to others if we don't take a stand. A few words, a couple of sentences. There's so much power in those words, and Sadiq Khan couldn't be bothered. But thankfully, and I think we're going to prove this, we've had to prove it before, we know the politicians don't help us, but we also know we don't need their help. Because we've managed it before. And what I'm delighted about this time is just how much the club are getting behind this campaign and getting on our side and getting the word out. Even Tom Werner, I don't know if you've seen it, he sent a letter to the French minister that was coming out with some of the bullshit, um, you know, making it clear that this this is not good enough and demanding an apology. Yeah, I've, I've not read the Tom Werner thing. I've, I've seen he's put something out and I've seen Billy Hogan put some, some things out. Steve mm-hmm. Rotherham, the Metro Mayor for Liverpool. Who got his on, phone nicked, by the way. He was mugged yeah, his phone nicked. Yeah, he was on uh, BBC Breakfast, I think, given his his short account and his phone was nicked. Ian Byrne, the um, Labour MP for Liverpool, mm-hmm. was there, was also at Hills, but he's been on TV given his account because he said how bad the scenes was and how you know similar it was to Hills. But um, I go to God that he stands up in Parliament to monitor because Prime Minister's questions and give them all an earful because... They did bloody deserve it. They're um, on holiday at the minute, though, aren't they? So, well, you know, no, they're holidays. <laughs> when I did not, um, but you know, I, I don't pay that much attention to it because I don't know whether they're in the house, the what they're doing, who's up, who's down, what job they're in, and everything. Because they all just fiddle it around to please themselves. But you know, there, there is a couple of people within reputable positions, and the fact that the club is strongly putting it out there, and there's a survey or questionnaire, sorry, um, for fans who were in Paris mm-hmm. to fill in and give their accounts. And it just adds more weight to the support that the club are going to go in with. And I don't know how we're going to deal with it. Like, you don't want to not be in the Champions League because it's the premier European competition, but you are feel like sticking two fingers up to them and saying, sod your competition. Yeah. Because look at the way we're treated. Yeah, um, I feel like, yeah, we're, we're going to do the Super League, but we're going to do it properly now. We don't need you, you know. Yeah. Um, Get other other clubs on your side because I know we won't be the only ones who feel worried about this. Yeah, and I, you know, it, next year's finals in Turkey in Istanbul, ironically the scene of two thousand and five, and I deep down, Liverpool fans are really, really want to get there and win that. Not only because of like the historical connection to two thousand and five, but 
again, to put two fingers up and say to Wayfair, well, Sodgers, this is what we can do. We don't care about your lies, your conspiracies and all your manifestations of corruption. We will do it our way. And we know we've been to Turkey before and we know how well we're received. A lot of people in the pool go on holidays to Turkey. It's a really popular destination for people from the city as well as from like people around the country. But a lot of people feel a connection to there. I'm sure anyone who knows anybody in Liverpool have been on holidays to Turkey at some point in their life and they all say positive things about it. So we would really probably want to get back there. Um, but on the other hand, we we really need to you know, stick it to you for one way or another. I don't know how, how it's going to happen. I, I've always gone the game and when you're there, the Champions League anthem, it makes the hairs in the back of your neck yeah. stand up. It gives you that little mm-hmm. feeling of like nostalgia like from when you're a child watching it on ITV uh, when it used to be free to wear and now the privilege of going the game and, and hearing the anthem. I fully expect that to be booed. Like yeah. Man City fans yeah. boo it for their own idiotic reason that they think they've been mistreated but that's their own doing. You even have a Spotify playlist, don't you, when it's yeah. when, when you're getting near to a final and things like that. It yeah. means something. But now I don't know, it's, it's our history is, is is like embedded, you know, it's silver line that goes through our whole history is about that those European, European cups. Club. All those versions of big ears that we've won. And yet the fact that it's UEFA's thing is I mean I don't think we'll let it tarnish the name of the cup because I've always said this, the football and the clubs and the people and all that, that's what football is. The corporate people, the greedy people sat in boardrooms cooking up schemes to make themselves even richer. They're not football. And I do think football will carry on despite them. It's just, I think we've given them too much time now and I think we've, we've got to find ways to get good governance. I know even, nothing will come of it, but in this country, the government are supposedly trying to get new governance for football and because the FA are hopeless. The FA... I've never the, the, the FA are partly responsible for what happened at Hillsborough and they're, they're a big horrible organisation that puts fans last um, and one of the reasons I'm mentioning that is because this is another thing that wound me up uh, you were talking about people without tickets and people struggling to get tickets and all the rest of it and the fact that fakes became a thing the FA love to do it at Wembley they give they give a fraction of the tickets for the to each side and most of them go to other people in the FA family. UEFA are no different. Loads went on some ballot that anyone could apply to months ago without knowing who was in the final. And so what, what happens to all of these tickets? Because when you look at that stadium, apart from all the empty seats from the people stuck outside, there weren't very many that weren't either in white or in red. You know, most of those seats in that stadium were either Madrid people or Liverpool fans, you know, Madrid fans, Liverpool fans. Now, given that there was such a tiny fraction actually got sold officially to Liverpool and Madrid fans, where where did the rest come from? And basically, they create a market for forgeries, and now they're complaining that there's some kind of industrial scale forgery going on. If if the only people who could get tickets to a match knew that you had to get them from the club, it would be so much harder to get away with selling forgeries. Because you'd know you'd have to have some link to your club to get your ticket. Yeah, I, I I was lucky enough to get one through the club's palace. And you had to go on the club website, log in prior to get any ticket to prove that you were... Obviously, the system recognised that you were eligible. Um, select your seat, and then there was two of us. So you have to obviously designate who's having what ticket. If you yeah. try to designate it to someone else, it doesn't work. Um, so, like, the club, for as bad as they are with, like, the ticket system, and we can go into that one forever, but the way they've done this was, you know, you, you've got to be proven to have got an actual successful ballot application, um, and then you get the ticket sent out on a recorded signed for delivery, or you can go and collect it at the ground, and I chose to get it recorded and signed for because I just don't have time to... To mm-hmm. drive to the ground and waiting queues for it. But when they come, the you know, like they check your name and whatever and hand it over to you. Um, but you had like, I'd say on the night, it looked like two thirds of the ground was red. And mm-hmm. Liverpool fans, I like, we literally encased the whole stadium apart from the Madrid end. And you've got to then ask questions, as you say, like as to, well, how much are people paying to get there? Because People have been taking advantage of, and how many hands have those tickets gone through to 
to actually get to an actual genuine fan, like has it gone through three or four hands and therefore the price increases? I mean, you don't have to look online and see the prices were in the thousands for tickets. Um, and this is a situation, as you say, manifested by UEFA. So they can't claim like they did, what, 12 months ago or whatever it was, that the Super League was a shambles and football is for fans and then literally do what they did in terms of the ticket allocation and then blame the fans for the situation that they manifested and had control of. It's just complete hypocrisy from the whole top to bottom with them. Yeah, it should be. The money they get off sponsors, the money they get off broadcasters, the money we shell out in so many other ways because because as fans, like if you want to watch a game on the telly, you pay for like a Sky subscription, a BT Sports subscription, an Amazon subscription. I think I've named them all, but it feels like there's always another one going to come along. And if you... If you're if you're a match goer, obviously you pay for your ticket to the ground and stuff, and and that you're paying to support your club when you buy your ticket for your own team. But the Champions League final, shouldn't the reward as fans be that the charge for the tickets is basically cost price? That the that the sponsors and broadcasters are, are going to foot the bill for hosting the event as much as possible, and that it goes to real fans, and the tickets are priced at a reasonable amount that people can afford when they've also got to factor in flights, ferries, or crappy coaches to get out there because that that to me is another another reason the forgeries are being sold is that the money that they've got listed on them as face value you know any kind of sort of organized crime person or even half baked crime person is going to look at that and think how much money can i you know if i print 20 fake tickets and sell them at double the face value i can make an absolute fortune really easily if i can get away with it and the, the fact you you know factor that out into loads of people you know anyone with sort of access to printing facilities and all the rest of it, it it's it's easier than printing money easier than forging money and more lucrative i'd say and yet uefa just seem blind to the fact that they've caused that yeah it's there was there was a ticket scam that went on last week it was um a page on twitter which had sold tickets um throughout the season for major events a lot of Liverpool tickets and mm. people invested a lot of money. Um, I don't think there's actually been a, a final figure on it, but there is a, a genuine figure of at least over a hundred grand worth of money sent to these people in goodwill and faith that they actually had tickets available, and they never actually did. Um, and a lot of people have now gone. Oh, it was in the police. It was in. It's in the hands of the police, but it was also in. Um, you know local newspapers, national radio it made last week about um, fans being scammed out of tickets and it just you know, it manifests because you wait for the creating the situation as you say it's it's not for the fans anymore, it's the bottom line is money, whoever whoever can make money whichever way possible and obviously the clowns that you wait for who were, you know, we've seen over the years how much money people who've been in charge and or in positions of power at that company have fleeced and continues to fleece and even I think it was uh, Andy Rotherham uh, Steve Rotherham sorry was saying he had a conversation with Seflin who's the current boss at UEFA and he had no time for, for what was going on and you know he's probably just in the position purely for money and power and it just goes on and on and on and on yeah. and on and I think right now I I'm actually glad we've reached the end of the season and we've got, mm. what, seven, eight weeks away from football or two months um, until genuine football starts again. I'm actually glad that I can put it on the back burner and focus on other things in my life for mm-hmm. a few weeks because like, what's happened at the weekend has, has shocked and hurt a lot of people and made them take a step back and really take stock about going to football games. and Yeah. I'm in a lucky position to be able to go every week to the home games. And you now look at like going to Anfield and you think, well, sometimes you'd moan for waiting 10, 15, 20 minutes in a queue to get into the turnstile. I'll never moan again for waiting 10 or 15, 20 minutes anymore to get into Anfield. Um, Because I've choose to go and have a pint in the pub and turn up to the ground at half two, 20 to three for the three o'clock kickoff when, you know, for the UEFA Champions League final, I turned up two and a half hours before because I was told it weren't easy to get in. I didn't expect to be waiting that long. 
And you um, want to get in there and support your team, don't you? You know, it's like yeah. it just it just puts a lot into perspective. And the sad thing is now there'll be a lot of people who won't go abroad and support Liverpool. There'll be a lot of people who will think twice about going to football altogether. Like a lot of people have become disenfranchised with football because of the way it's gone over recent times. But what happened on the weekend has really, really affected people. And there's people who haven't even spoken about it yet. Like yeah. how how much it hurt them and how, how affected they are physically, mo- mentally, and emotionally. Like yeah. football is for the people. It's it it it's a fun game. It's meant to cheer you up. And the way everyone's currently feeling about this situation, it's really the complete opposite of that. Yeah, I think I think we we'll probably probably wind up round up now on this because. The thing is, we can go on and on and on, and there's so much to say, and I don't think we've touched on half the things we could have said, and we've re- barely touched the match or anything. But the the thing is, the truth is, what you said there is that people will have stories to tell. My my advice would be, the thing that Liverpool are doing, it's on the website, I think I tweeted it as well, is get your thoughts down as quick as you can while it's still fresh in your mind. If you've got any photos or footage, you can attach that as well, I'm told, and just collate it all together, get it all together, get it all out on that and let Liverpool know what's gone on because the more evidence they've got, they can just basically throw it all at France or the French authorities, the Paris authorities and say, look, try and argue your way out of that with your lies. And I think the more evidence we get, the better. Unlike 1989, there won't be any police telling people to change the statements because these will be your statements that you that you made that the club are going to take care of for you and make sure get in front of the right people. But the other thing as well is, I would say anyone who's feeling kind of almost embarrassed or ashamed to say how much it's hurt them, don't. Because it's going to hurt you. It's going to have an impact on you. Even if now you're not thinking it, it's going to hit you at some point probably. So, so talk to someone. If you've got someone you can trust to talk to, someone, whether it's your family or your friends, feel, you know, talk to them, but reach out. I mean, if you want to contact any of us on Twitter or Discord, give us a shout. Anyone on Anfield in this, we'll all listen to you. We'll all do our best to help you, but there's nothing we can say really to help you other than, you know, we'll, we'll try and listen because, what you've been through, if you were involved in that in that event, was horrendous. If if you not even weren't even there, and it brings back bad memories, you know, please share them. Don't bottle them up, because the better out than in, and you you will feel better if you do that, and you'll find that you're not the only one feeling like that. And you know, I'm sorry that this show has been such a kind of miserable and angry one because it shouldn't have been. Even with the score as it was, it shouldn't have been. We had an amazing season. The parade in Liverpool showed just how much this club is still loved and how much these players are. And you know what? It's just great to see from top to bottom. Everyone at that club is grateful for its fans and everyone of the fans is grateful for its club. And for all the people on Twitter who are having a go at us, you know what? Up yours because you'd love to have what we have and you don't. So on that note, I'm going to leave it because I'll be here all day. Jay, thank you and I hope you're feeling better soon as well and everyone thanks for listening and as i say get in touch we won't go away over the summer we'll have loads to talk about but you know if we do have a bit of a rest don't don't take it out on us because maybe we we need a bit of a break but i'm sure we'll be back soon thanks for listening and for now goodbye we hope you enjoyed listening to this anfield index show please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically there's nothing quite like fan engagement And we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, We'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.